I'm Everett Olgner. I run the Storage Specialist Solutions Architecture team in EMEA. As you can clearly tell from my accent, uh, I live in Berlin, Germany. Um, and today we're going to be talking about data migration into AWS. So I know that it says data migration services, and we did the session on Wednesday, and I think there was a little bit of confusion. As I saw in the feedback, people thought that meant database migration services. We have one slide on DBMS. So if you're here for a deep dive on DBMS, I'm sorry, but you're in the wrong room. We're going to be talking about how to move you know, large-scale data sets, file data, object data, backup data, things like that into AWS. This is a 200-level session, so we're going to be giving you, I'm going to be giving you information on where to start, some of the differences between online and offline migration, things to think about. I hope that what you get out of this session is that you leave with a better understanding of the ways that you can move data into and even out of AWS, and that you have a good idea where to start when it comes to which service do I choose? Where do I put the data on the other end? And so we'll talk through all of those things. We'll talk through the options that you have from AWS. We've got a slide for partners. I'm going to talk about a few case studies and hopefully share some lessons learned uh, and maybe save you from some pain if you have your own data migration. And then at the very end, and I failed at this on Monday, so we're going to try again. The lightning round, this was the challenge from the marketing team, was five slides, five services, five minutes. I think it took me nine minutes on Monday when we did this session. And for you guys in the front row, be warned, I have this habit of standing at the very front of the stage, sometimes with my toes hanging off, and there's usually a betting pool to see if this is the year that I'm going to fall off the stage. So you're, you've been warned. So this is what we're not focusing on today. This is not a 300, 400 level session. That means there's not JSON documents and code samples and scripts in my slides although I probably have some things I can email you if you need them. We're not doing protocol level deep dives. We're not doing service level deep dives. If you're, if you're interested in that stuff, those sessions exist. This is not that session. So just so we're all in the same room and if anybody wants to you know, leave because you're in the wrong place, I probably won't take it personally. Um, so you know, don't, don't feel bad if you're in the wrong place. When you're doing migration, there's some things that you have to think about. Um, and this is kind of the silly one, but you know, why, why are you moving whatever it is that you're moving? All of the questions that we're about to walk through, and there's a handful of them, these all dictate the service that you should choose. You know, why is kind of the high level? Why am I doing it? But it feeds into the rest of the questions. What are you moving? Is it archive data? Is it live production data? Is it backup data? Is it compliant data? Uh, file system data? End user data? I mean, there's, the list is endless, right? There's a lot of different things. Why are you doing it? What is it? What applications are attached to it? Is the application able to run in the cloud? I mean, most things are, but do you have to convert it? Does it natively speak to the S3 API? Does it require a specific version of SMB or a specific version of NFS to be successful? Where is it going? See how these feed into each other? Why am I doing it? What is it? What's the application? What's the requirement? That's going to dictate where you're going to put it once it gets inside of AWS. So if you move the data and you get it onto a tier of storage where the application can't connect to it, you're going to have to move it again. And it's not going to be a lot of fun. It's time consuming. When do you need to finish? This is, always, this is always a fun question. So I've, I've been in storage for about 22 or 23 years now. I've done a lot of migrations. I've done a lot of replication. And as you work through a list like this and you get kind of your stakeholders together and you get your application owners together, and you know, one of the first questions is rank your, your applications based on how important they are to the business. And it never fails. Every application is the most important application to the business, and if it went down or if I lost one minute worth of data, we would be out of business tomorrow. Every application across the board. That's probably the answer that you're going to get, even the one that you know, runs the company intranet that shows you where you can get discounts on things. Everybody, to them, their data and their application is the most important thing. 
So you have to go through, rank all of these things, collect this information, figure out when you need to finish. Very critical. How much data do you have? You probably have things hidden somewhere that you don't know about. There's probably a server sitting under somebody's desk that has a file share on it. As I've seen this time and time again, I'm still shocked. I don't know why. But it's probably sitting there, it's probably got data on it, and maybe it's actually data that's critical to the business, but it's kind of the shadow IT model. They've never moved it in someplace else. So you have these things sitting out there that you're gonna to have to manage and have to deal with. Also key, how much network capacity do you have? And we're gonna go into this in some more detail as we go on about why this is so important, especially when you decide, am I gonna do an online or an offline migration? Because how you move the data, the services that you choose, depends on the answer to all of these questions. This, let me tell you, this slide was really fun to get through marketing. So we have to turn our decks in and they review everything. And I got this phone call that said, why is there kitty litter on your slide? I said, there's a story, I promise. So as I said, I've been doing this for a long time. When you start to migrate things, you've got a box up there because you probably have data, you've got zipped things, you've got that server sitting under somebody's desk. It's all this sort of contained data that you have no idea what it is. We've got our shredded files the next because you're, there's a high probability you're gonna migrate some things that you shouldn't be migrating. Maybe it's data that should be expunged, it should be deleted. Um, you know, whatever the case is, if you understand what you have, you can avoid that. The record is there because several years ago, uh, I worked for a company that made fiber channel to IP routers. And I worked on this project where we were replicating data from Japan to the United States and then a second hop from one coast in the United States to the other. And at some point we figured out that the customer is replicating terabytes of music files. They weren't a music company. It was some guy's MP3 collection that he'd been collecting all of these files, storing them out on a filer, and now they're replicating it around the world and protecting it. The kitty litter. You probably have stuff that would be in that box in your network somewhere. Somebody is storing something that they shouldn't be storing, that it has no business value. Maybe it's even a liability. So you need to understand these things because it's, it's time consuming. It costs money to do migrations. It costs money to back things up, to replicate, to protect data, to put it in multiple regions. So if you can understand what you have and what the business value is, it makes a big difference. When you, when you start the process of migration or you start to choose tools to do the migration, there's, there's a lot of options. You can write it yourself, you can write scripts. Uh, I had dinner with a customer the other night that they're just writing their own application. They're actually writing their own application to do all of this, to go out and scan, to figure out what they have, when it was last used, should they actually move it into the cloud, should they be keeping it on premises. Um, there's a lot of heavy lifting that goes into that. There's open source tools, there's freeware, there's the paid version, you know, commercial tools. You have all of these things. I've even worked with people that just rent software for a few months to do their migration. That can get expensive. And so we've been doing this for decades. I've been doing it for two decades. But the size is massively increasing, especially in my time at AWS. You know, when I joined, a couple of hundred terabytes was a lot of data. And now a couple of hundred terabytes is, that's easy. We can, we can do that in 24 hours. Talk to me about 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 petabytes, and that's a meaty conversation. So it's interesting how your perspective changes, especially over time. And we all know that data is growing uncontrollably. We're not gonna talk about that. Um, you know, the saying that I always use is there's two types of businesses. Those that have uncontrollable data growth and those that are preparing to go out of business, they just don't know it yet. Like if your data's not growing, something's wrong, right? So when you choose a tool, when you start to go through this process, whether it's an AWS tool, a partner tool, you're writing your own, you're getting freeware, open source, whatever, there's a lot of stuff to think about. Reporting is critical. Recovery is critical. Being able to restart a process is critical. Because if you don't have reporting, how do you know that you moved everything? If you can't recover from errors, does that mean that you have to restart an entire migration? Let's say you're migrating 100 terabytes and you're down to the last 10, 
and something goes wrong in the script or something goes wrong in the tool, if you have to migrate the 90 terabytes again, you're really wasting money and wasting time. So you want to know what's supported. You want to think about these things. You know, performance and parallelization is probably a big one. There are some really good tools out there, open source things, things that are built into the operating system or free from the vendor. But when you start to run it, you realize that a lot of these tools were built to do a migration inside of your data center from one server to another server over a one gig LAN. When you start to look at going longer distance, you get performance problems. When you start to look at like going into something like S3, which is massively scalable and very performant, when you have parallelization, single TCP flow doesn't get you there. You need to have multiple connections. So concurrency, parallelization, key to performance. So you want to understand all of these things, especially if you're going out and using something open source or writing scripts. Of course, we've done a lot of this work for you. We've thought about all of these things. So if you look at what we have at AWS, it kind of falls into maybe two broad categories that we're gonna talk about today. Offline data transfer with the Snow family, online transfer with things like Cloud Endure and um, Storage Gateway and AWS Data Sync. We'll talk a little bit about kind of the streaming data and the hybrid uh, and edge gateways, but we give you a lot of options to be able to move data online or offline, large amounts of data very quickly. We also have a lot of partners that do this. And on this slide, this is kind of the big generic storage partner slide. And so this has not only um, consulting partners on the far right, and these are the people that can actually help you do the work and can, can do the migration for you and help you plan for the migration, but as you come the other way on the slide, these are all companies that have built tools, they've got integrations with AWS, and they can solve problems whether you're doing business continuance and backup, you're doing a migration, or you need primary storage. We have a lot of partners. This is um, all available on the AWS website. So let's talk about online and offline. And this might seem like a silly conversation. This is a 200 level session, but I've learned that there's a lot of misconceptions about the best way to move data. And online and offline, two slides on this and then we'll move on, I promise. There's a, there's a couple of things that, that you need to understand. So an online data migration, we're reading data from the source, we're doing it asynchronous, asynchronously, we're transferring it up into AWS. The application's still online, the data is still available. This is a real time process or near real time for the transfer. This means that you have to have WAN bandwidth to be able to do it. I've had conversations with customers where they say, we're gonna move a petabyte of data, awesome. We wanna do it online from our application. We're gonna put it into S3. Okay, cool, we can do that. We do that all the time. What's your network look like? I've got a 100 megabit leased line and 80 megabits of it is full every single day for 12 hours because it's our application and our internet traffic. Now we have a problem. And this is where we get back to the earlier conversation about how quickly do you need to get this done? So if you tell me I need to move that in a week, it's probably not gonna happen. It's definitely not gonna happen. So maybe offline is a better choice for you. So if you don't have the available bandwidth, you don't have an efficient clean bandwidth, then certainly offline is the way to go. Offline means that we're taking a copy of that data, we're putting it onto a device like Snowball, and we're shipping it through the mail, or not through the mail, but we're shipping it with a carrier back to AWS where we do the data transfer. To be able to do online, as I said, you need decent bandwidth. It needs to be fairly reliable. You need to have enough of it to meet your end goal of when you want that migration to complete. Offline, you just need a way to plug in something like a Snowball or Snowball Edge or Snowmobile into your network and a workstation to be able to copy the data onto the device, and then you ship it back. It's pretty straightforward. When we talk about how long does it take to move data, um, we're actually gonna go through a case study in a few slides where I'm gonna give you an example uh, on, on a very large migration that we did and how we were able to accomplish it with a mix of technology. And 
this is important. This takes into account overhead, but this gives you an idea. If I want to move a petabyte of data and have got a 100 megabit connection, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, you could do it over a three-year time span, but does that really meet the business goals? Probably not. So this helps play into, do I do an online migration or an offline migration? If I'm doing an online migration, which tool do I use? What, what types of efficiency should I be looking for? So for an online data transfer, we're gonna start with, or data migration, we're gonna start with DataSync. DataSync is a service that was launched 53 weeks ago yesterday. We actually went out last night and celebrated the 53-week anniversary of the launch of AWS DataSync. So we launched it last year at reInvent. And this is a way to transfer data from file systems on premises into AWS. And it's, it's extremely efficient. We put a lot of work into the upper layer protocols, actually wrote our own, to be able to do the data transfer on top of TCP. It's in, today it's TCP, it's a heavily optimized version of TCP. It's actually very good at recovering from errors, dropped packets, out of order packets, overcoming the effects of latency. No one can remove latency from a link. Latency is a speed of light problem. I've heard people say sometimes that we can reduce the latency on your network. Unless you push the, the, the locations closer together, you can't make light go faster. So the latency problem is going to exist We've done things to help solve the protocol problem when it comes to latency, so that you can fill a 10 gig or 100 gig link to be able to do very fast migrations. DataSync is extremely easy to use. It's a virtual machine that you deploy in VMware on your network. You point it at a source, NFS or SMB, and you tell us where you want to put the data inside your AWS account. It's pretty simple. Everything is encrypted. As we talk today, all the services that we're going to be talking about, the data is encrypted. It's encrypted in transit. With DataSync, we don't store the data in the service. So DataSync is a client that you connect to NFS or SMB. It reads the data. It transfers it into EFS or into S3 inside of your VPC in AWS. Everything is encrypted along the way. We don't store data. There is no cache. It's not a server. It's completely integrated with all of the AWS services that you're using today. All of the reporting, the security services, so CloudWatch and CloudTrail. Um, you can script everything, the CLI tools work, all of it is there. And it's pretty cost effective. We actually just lowered the price on this a few weeks ago. It's 1.25 cents per gigabyte for data transferred. So the way that DataSync works, I mentioned the agent. When I say agent, this isn't like a backup agent or an antivirus agent where you install a piece of software into your operating system. This is a virtual machine. It's just the name that we use for it is agent, data sync agent. So you deploy this in a virtual environment, connect it to your NFS or SMB file share, and then you go through and create jobs. And you can filter based on things that you want to include in the transfer, things you want to exclude from the transfer. You can build multiple jobs. You can schedule things. And then when you do your migration, your agent running inside of your data center connects to an instance that we stand up on your behalf, so it's fully managed. And when it gets to that instance, that's where it gets unencrypted, uncompressed, and then transferred through your VPC into whatever service you've told us you want to put the data in. So today that's S3 or EFS. Couple of tips about data sync. Bottlenecks are a moving target. We'll see this when we go through a customer example in a few slides, that when we're talking about moving large amounts of data at very high speeds, especially if we're talking about petabytes at 10 gigabits per second, that's 100 terabytes per day. The bottleneck is a moving target. And we'll talk about this next one with this customer where we, we were chasing the bottlenecks. And it's probably not gonna be the WAN especially if you have a 10 gig direct connect into AWS and the network is efficient, you have a clean path, it moves back into the storage, it moves into the clients, it moves into the land. So you're sort of always chasing it to make this as fast as you possibly can. And the source system, if you're reading off of say a file or off of a NAS device, that NAS device is gonna dictate the read performance. 
based on how many volumes it has, how busy it is, how many network connections it has. So that's, that's gonna be the source. We have to rely on that to give us the data. And the last one up there, protocol errors are devious. Um, I've worked on projects where we've had to chase protocol errors, and a lot of times it's a file share protocol error for SMB or NFS. And we have to dig through it and figure out, is it happening in the network? Is it happening on the source file system? Is it happening um, in our VM? Sometimes, you know, things get corrupted as they go through the network. So we had to figure out where all the problems are. Um, and the last piece, with data sync, we have a verification option. So for those of you that run backup, you know about the verify box where it goes back through and it reads everything off the tape or out of the disk, compares it to the source. So this is my very, very sad attempt at a Shakespeare pun. To verify or not to verify, it's a question, but it's not the right question. The right question is, when do you verify? Because verification takes time. When you run a verification with data sync, we go back through the source file system, we rehash the content, we collect all the metadata, and we do the same thing on the destination, whether it's S3 or EFS, and we compare the two together, every piece of information, to make sure that what you read, what you have on your source file system in your data center, is exactly the same as what landed inside of AWS. That takes time. So maybe you don't wanna do that constantly, maybe you want to chunk things up, you want to do it on a share level, you want to do it on uh, aggregate directories, you have to make those decisions. So, has anybody seen those videos on the internet where it's a blender, and the company takes things like cell phones and they put them in the blender and to see what will happen? So will it sync? Six petabytes of data sitting on a NAS device in a data center. 90 days to move six petabytes into S3. Successful migrations previously off of the same filer using Snowball Edge. And they have a 10 gigabit direct connect. I don't do a lot of interactive things, but who thinks that you can actually move six petabytes of data over a WAN, over a network connection in 90 days? Anybody? Okay, you guys are a good crowd, or you're still all waking up and haven't had enough coffee yet. So this is what our environment looked like with this customer. We had our NAS device. We actually ended up running multiple data sync agents. And this goes back to the protocol errors are devious and, and sort of network errors are, or can be hard to chase. We had to use two data sync agents because we discovered that the connections out of a single agent, while an agent will process and run it wire speed, you know, line rate 10 gigabits per second, the device that we were reading from had limitations on the number of connections. And if you didn't have enough connections, you couldn't hit 10 gigabits per second. Even though it had multiple 10 gig ports out connected to the LAN, we had to run multiple agents so that we could scale up to a high enough number of connections in parallel to be able to get 10 gigs off of it. We also discovered that there were multiple LAN segments between this sort of storage LAN where this filer and all of its clients were connected to be able to get to the direct connect that came into AWS. And if you can imagine trying to move six petabytes in 90 days, that's 100 terabytes per day that you have to hit, running that over production LAN tends to slow things down. So we had to make sure that we could go around the production segments to get to the direct connect. So we did move 100 terabytes per day using the two agents. We did move six petabytes in 90 days. And this is where verification was important because we learned that running verification on every single job slowed down the next job. And we ended up running verification multiple times in the same sets of data. And so we figured out that, okay, we're now gonna chunk up the verification jobs. And we're gonna verify after we loop move a large amount of data. And we can let some, one of the agents go off and do the verification and we can use the other agent. We'll keep moving the next batch of data and we can move things back and forth. We can do things in parallel. So we had to get a little creative to be able to do this, but you can move six petabytes in 90 days over a 10 gig direct connect. So some lessons learned. As I keep saying, the network path is critical. 
you really learn a lot about your network when you try to, to stuff 10 gigabits of continuous traffic over it. I've seen this time and time again with replication. Um, you know, it used to be in the old WAN days, you had a committed information rate, and then you had what you actually get on a daily basis. Like, you've got a one gig connection, but it's only committed at 500 megabits. And then you turn on something like data sync, or you start doing replication, and if you tell this device that it has a gigabit, and it can read data at a gigabit, it is gonna try and transfer a gigabit over the network. And now you start to learn things like, we have 10 gig infrastructure, but for some reason, between two core switches, somebody connected a one gig port. That's happened. And as soon as we start pumping 10 gigs of data over that thing constantly, the network comes down and it starts throwing errors. So you're gonna learn these things. It's important to know sort of what that network path looks like if you're moving a large amount of data and you wanna do it very quickly. We had a lot of issues with the NAS device actually being able to give us 10 gigabits per second of data. So this is where we had some protocol errors, which is this one, multiple NFS errors, performance errors coming out of the network ports, performance errors coming out of the controllers. And some of the LUNs, some of the RAID groups or you know, RAID sets that were created, yes, you can get very large SATA drives. You can RAID five those things together and have a really massive LUN and put a big file system on it. But then when you're trying to read at 10 gigabits per second off of that file system, you realize that four or five SATA drives don't have enough IOPS to be able to serve that type of data continuously. So that's why I say it's a moving target to get to where's the bottleneck. It's not just always as simple as saying, oh, it's that thing, and when we fix that, all the problems are gonna go away. Not trying to scare you, just trying to give you some real world tips and advice on if you're moving large amounts of data even moderate amounts of data, but doing things at, at very high speed, you start to find some of the flaws that may exist in the network. We also have a storage gateway migration. And storage gateway isn't normally a migration tool. And I get a lot of questions about what's the difference between storage gateway and data sync. Data sync's a client. Remember I said we don't cache anything, it's not a server, it's an NFS or SMB client. File gateway is kind of the exact opposite. It has an SMB and an NFS server. It has onboard cache, and it connects back to an S3 bucket, and it presents that S3 bucket as a file share. So you can write data to it, the data gets cached locally, you get high performance, fast response. If you're doing a read that's in cache, you get a fast response back, you get your data very quickly. And everything is backed by S3, and you can put it on any tier of S3 and lifecycle to Glacier. So you've got a lot of flexibility. But it's about taking an application that you want to cloud enable that doesn't support S3 natively and letting it use S3 and use other cloud services. And so this customer, we did a migration with File Gateway. This was actually before we had launched Data Sync. And the reason I'm talking about this is because this one was an interesting use case, because this is uh, patient data, it's healthcare data for this customer, and they have this application that collects all of this data, and it writes it out to NFS. So we're doing the migration. This was actually one where it was rental software. We had to run a bunch of, a bunch of devices on the network to be able to fill all the bandwidth. And, and it was interesting. And why it was interesting is that they did this. And you can see that we added one line. So now we have the application connected to the file gateway and to the NAS device. Because they did this as an online migration while they were using the data. So now we have some of our data set in S3 accessible through a file gateway and some of our data set uh, on premises in this NAS device and the application is reading from both places. Eventually it looked like this. They took the NAS device away, the file gateway is now the interface to S3 and they're moving all the data in and out of S3 this way. The long-term plan is actually to build native S3 API support into the application and to take the file gateway away and just natively talk to S3. But file gateway gives you a path to do a migration with a tool that doesn't talk to S3 and even to let that same application continue using the data that it was using on premises. And nothing has to change. One of the things that we learned is that with, with the healthcare data and the patient data, and I've seen the same thing with financial data, is there's a concern over how do I know the data that lands in S3 or lands in Glacier or lands in the service in AWS is the same as the data 
that I have on-premises. So we talked about verify for data sync. With, when data sync runs, we do that up front. We fingerprint everything. We get a hash value up front before we move it. We make sure that when it hits the target, it's the same. Verify is your next step to be extra sure. Like that's your paranoid step. I really want to know that it's the same. You run the verify. With file gateway, because this was such sensitive data for this customer, they actually built a process in EC2 where they stood up EC2 instances, they read all the data in, they recalculated the hash values, and then they compared it to the hash value that they had on premises. File gateway, much like data sync, hashes every file before it uploads it into S3. And in S3, there's an option in the header for, I think it's, um, it's either MD5 hyphen content or content hyphen MD5, I always forget which one it is. But when you do the put, you can include the hash value. And S3 as a service will then recalculate that hash value, it does that anyway, compare it to what you included in the put in the header, and if it's not the same, it fails the put. File Gateway does that automatically. So any data that lands on file gateway when it's in the cache will be identical to what is uploaded into S3 because if it fails, it's gonna send it again. Now, the caveat to this with something like patient data, I can't guarantee, we can't guarantee that when you wrote it across the LAN, nothing changed. So the software that they were using to read off of this device and write it onto the file gateway, we don't control that process. We can only control from the file gateway into AWS. So for this customer, it was a valid reason to stand up these EC2 instances and to go through the process. I gotta talk faster, I'm gonna run out of time. To go through the process of um, verifying that the data was same because it's patient data. So next we're gonna talk about Cloud Endure. And if I can talk fast enough, we'll have time for questions at the end. Otherwise, I'll, I'll hang out and you guys can come ask me questions. So I'm just gonna build this one out. So Cloud Endure, we've been talking about migrating file system data, migrating object data, migrating backup data. Cloud Endure is about migrating and even doing DR for operating systems and applications. So there's a lot of flexibility on how you deploy. You put an agent onto and this is a true agent that gets installed onto the operating system. It migrates data at a block level. Everything is encrypted in transit. It lands up into the service, and you can build these tools, these blueprints to automate the recovery process or to automate turning on this migrated environment, including doing things like it will automatically go through and replace all the drivers. It will strip out the things that it does not need to run inside of EC2 on AWS and replace them with AWS drivers for things. This all happens automatically at the OS level. It doesn't need to know about the application because it's working at the block level. It's reading raw block data off of the devices through the operating system, so the application doesn't matter. When you do the migration or even DR with Cloud Endure, you can see on the far left that we have two servers running. One has, the one on the top has three disks. The one on the bottom has two disks. As we move to the middle section, the staging area, we stand up a Linux instance, we attach low-cost EBS volumes to that instance, and when you start to do the replication in, the continuous replication, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So you can see in the middle, we have five EBS volumes that are catching the data from on-premises. And on the far right, this is our target subnet. This is what happens when you click the failover or the you know, turn on the environment button, single button. We'll stand up those two EC2 instances to match what you had on premises in your data center. We map the EBS volumes, the correct volumes to the correct server in the same order. Boot everything up, change all the drivers, change the IPs, and you're up and running. When I first got access um, to the Cloud Endure software, I did what probably all of you would do, and I got my licenses, and I loaded it onto a couple of servers, and I didn't bother to read the documentation. I just wanted to see if I could figure it out on my own. And it took about 15 minutes, because there were a few things that, you know, not having worked with it before that I had to figure out, and one or two things I had to look up, but it's really straightforward, it's really simple to get this up and running and to start migrating and protecting data for either, you know, DR or just migrating into the cloud. And you can go from all of these operating systems that are up there in that, that third bar, which means that you can also migrate from other cloud providers. 
You can migrate from virtual environments. You can migrate from physical environments. You can move all of these applications and operating systems into AWS and have them automatically converted to run inside of EC2. So let's talk about offline. And for offline, we have the Snow family. So Snowball that we launched 2012, 2013, I forget. Snowball Edge that I think was 2015. Snowmobile that was 2016. Was anybody at reInvent 2016 when we launched Snowmobile? Or maybe it was 2017. In the keynote, you can see this in the video. In the keynote, it's great because Andy Jassy, our CEO, is talking about you know, doing large-scale migrations and customers that we've had with Snowball Edge that have moved petabytes of data. And he talked about you know, how do you move exabytes of data? How do you move 100 petabytes of data in one shot? And this side of the stage opens up and they drive a 45-foot container connected to a tractor out into the, into the uh, show floor or into the keynote. And you can see people laughing in the audience, thinking it was a joke, at least that's what I assumed. And then he starts to talk about, you know, we've built this device that will move 100 petabytes of data in one shot. It's got multiple high-speed network connections. We roll it out, you connect it to your data center, fill it up with data, and we drive it back and load it into S3. And that became the way that you move massive amounts of data quickly and easily. I mean, how, do you, how else do you move 100 petabytes of data in one shot? You know, the only way that I've ever known to do that before this is you take all the arrays that it's on, replicate them to another array, you put those arrays into a truck and drive it to the other place. Well, we just built the truck with all the disk and all, everything inside of it so that you can just connect it and fill it up. Um, moving back to the left, Snowball Edge. That's, that's the most current version of the, of the Snow devices. With Snowball Edge, you can see there, it's, it's a 100 terabyte device when you order it, 82 terabytes usable. What's interesting about Snowball Edge is that you have the option to do compute. So you can run EC2 instances on a Snowball Edge. So that means as part of your data migration and part of your data collection process, you can pre-process data, you can tag data, you can transform data on the device that's actually gonna be shipped back and is gonna deliver the the, the data into AWS. It's a really simple process. You order this out of the console. We ship it to you, you unlock it, fill it up with data, ship it back, we verify it hasn't been tampered with, we put the data into your S3 bucket. Really straightforward. With Snowball, there's a client that you have to run. With Snowball Edge, there's an S3-like API built into the device. The reason that I say it's S3-like is that we can't do things like create or delete buckets because it's a self-contained device. And so there are some commands that don't work, like S3 create. Um, but everything else, you can use it, you can copy data, you can sync data, you can use the AWS S3 CP or S3 sync commands from the CLI to put data into a Snowball Edge. Everything is also encrypted inside the Snowball Edge. So when it's being transferred and in the Snowball, everything is encrypted. The keys don't travel with the device, ever. You have the manifest ID from your console. You also have the keys and the unlock code to be able to unlock the device, to encrypt all the data. And when you turn it off, the key is gone from memory. So that means that should somebody intercept it, should something bad happen to the device when it's being shipped back to AWS, the data is unreadable because that person wouldn't have the keys. So doing large scales migrations, in the interest of time, what I'm gonna say here is do the proof of concept. Get one and test it first. Because you're gonna learn a lot about the makeup of your data when you do the proof of concept. And better to learn it during a proof of concept than when you start a 500 terabyte migration and you're starting to copy data onto five devices at a time and then you discover that the bulk of your data is 32K and that you have hundreds of millions of tiny files. Small files are difficult for anybody to move, but we've built in features where we can actually batch those things up for you. Or if you go through and batch them and zip them up or tar them, there's a command, there's a flag that you can use when you copy it in to tell us that this is a batch data. And when we put it into S3, we explode it back out. So this lets you move a lot of five megabyte chunks of data rather than hundreds of millions of 32K or 8K or little tiny pieces of data. Because when you have those little tiny 
files, it destroys performance. It's painful for anything to be able to read them, to be able to write them, and to transfer them across the network. Um, the worst that I've ever seen is where the payload of the packet is smaller than the packet. You know, well, I guess that's always going to be true, but what I mean is the f entire file fits inside of a single packet. That's painful to be able to move those. There's more overhead than it's worth to be able to transfer that data. So we can help you fix that. So we talked about batching, certainly running things in parallel. I talked about this earlier with the network. Single TCP flow is never gonna be performant. 100 TCP flows is gonna be much more performant. It runs much faster. Certainly partitioning the data, chunking things up, understanding what you have from the beginning and getting it into manageable pieces that you can move it onto um, snowballs is very important. So you order the device, you have your workstation with the CLI, you copy data into the Snowball Edge. When it comes back to AWS, you've already told us in advance where you want it, that data to go. So we're gonna put it into an S3 bucket, but once it's in the S3 bucket, you have all of the flexibility and to free them to put it anywhere inside of AWS. And you can even use things like data sync inside of AWS to move data around. So we'll read data out and put it into EFS, or we'll take data that's in EFS and we'll put it into S3, or we'll go between regions for EFS. So you can do a migration using multiple tools at the same time. All right, I'm gonna start in four seconds. We have 18 minutes left. We're gonna try the lightning round and see if we can actually do this in five minutes. So transfer for SFTP. We launched this, I think, last year. Transfer for SFTP gives you the ability to stand up an SFTP server inside of AWS that's fully managed. You can bring your authentication service. You can bring your host name. It connects to an S3 bucket on the back end. This is one of the features that we had uh, customers request on a very regular basis because they were building their own Linux FTP and SFTP servers and then figuring out how to connect it to uh, S3 on the back end. So doing it with transfer for SFTP or AWS SFTP, you have this fully managed environment. And as part of that, you also get access to all of the AWS tools, all the reporting, all of the, um, the uh, like, wow, I just lost my train of thought. It's the, it's because I see the timer. Um, so you get CloudTrail, you get CloudWatch, all the things like that. So you get uh, kind of everything that you need to manage this environment using the tools that you're already used to using. Kinesis Firehose. I actually really like this service. So this is about IoT. This is about streaming data and transferring streaming data into AWS, putting it into an S3 bucket, and being able to do other things with it. Why Firehose is interesting is because you can split the data stream apart. You can get real-time analytics and real-time query on the data as it's streaming. And when I say IoT and streaming data, you're probably thinking of the picture on the far left there in a cell phone or cameras or devices. My favorite use case for this, uh, and this is a public reference that you can find on the website, is a um, chain of sushi restaurants in Japan. When I say sushi and IoT, you probably don't make the connection, because I know I didn't. But every plate, has an RFID on the bottom. And when the chef makes sushi, it's one of the, you know, where it travels around on the conveyor belt, they put it onto the plate, they scan the plate. They now know what's selling in every restaurant, they know what's popular, they know what they need to reorder. They also know that maybe there's a piece of fish that's been out onto the conveyor belt for a couple of minutes too long and they need to alert somebody to pull it off. So that's IoT, that's a streaming data environment with something that you probably wouldn't think of as IoT. S3 transfer acceleration, with S3, it's a global service. You can get the buckets over the internet. Transfer acceleration helps to solve the network problem. So I live in Berlin. If I'm connecting to a bucket that's in Singapore, I'm going pretty far around the world. If I'm doing that over the internet, packet loss and latency and out of orders are gonna hurt performance. Transfer acceleration is a way that you can turn this on connect to the closest AWS or Amazon edge location, and then your data gets transferred over the Amazon global network. And that means that you get all the bandwidth, you get protocol optimizations. We don't drop packets on our network. You shouldn't be getting any out of orders on our network. So you get the most efficient path from the edge back to the S3 bucket. 
storage gateway. We talked a little bit about file gateway before. We also have a volume mode that gives you access to block devices to LUNs over iSCSI, as well as a VTL mode that gives you 10 virtual tape drives, 1,500 virtual tape slots, and you can create the tapes, do your backups. If a tape is in the drive or in a tape slot, I have one minute left, then the data is gonna be sitting inside of S3. If you export the tape out, the same way that you would export a tape and give it to a driver, they put it in a lockbox and they drive it off to a vault somewhere, we put the data into Glacier or into Glacier Deep Archive. And we mark it as read-only. So you get the same workflow using Storage Gateway VCL that you would get doing it with a physical tape at a fraction of the cost. And the last thing, database migration service, DBMS or DMS, um, this lets you take databases that you have running on-premises inside of your data center, convert them into a managed AWS database solution. We can even transform databases, convert types of databases, but do the entire migration, test everything else as a managed service to get that database into AWS. We actually did it this time with 20 seconds to spare. So, last thing, training. If you go to this URL down at the bottom, slash training slash path hyphen storage, we have free training that's been created that's uh, available to you. You register for it, you can go through and take all of the classes, um, and it's, it's ready, readily available. So with that, we have 13 minutes left for Q&A. There's two microphones, or you can just yell at me. Um, so if there are any questions, So the question is, uh, Cloud Endure, and I'm going to overly simplify this, Cloud Endure versus DBMS. And for those of you that are leaving, please fill out your session surveys. I actually read all the feedback that you leave. Uh, sometimes it hurts a little, but I read all of it. So Cloud Endure, if you're doing a database migration with Cloud Endure and you're moving the operating system, that means that that's going to be completely running inside of EC2 you are still responsible for managing the database, managing the operating system, patching everything, protecting it, all of that. With DBMS, with the database migration service, you're moving from an on-premises database into a fully managed database environment like Aurora, RDS, Dynamo, something like that inside of AWS. So two really different use cases. You could potentially move it up, do a lift and shift with Cloud and Tour, and then decide later on that you want to migrate from that into one of the managed services. You have that option, too. Any other questions? I've spent a lot of time looking at that. So the question is, um, you know, online versus offline, size of data, time to, to be able to get that data in, and how do you cost optimize that? Uh, unfortunately, the only tip is really you have to do the math. So I've built tools, I've built my own spreadsheets that I can go through and figure out how long does it take to move it, and then I've put the pricing information in, at least for the regions I work in a lot in EMEA, to figure out, okay, if, we, if we're doing it with Snowball, it's gonna take this many snowballs, this many days, it's gonna cost this much, versus doing it with something like data sync or a file gateway or, or another migration tool. I mean, there's not a lot of advice that I can give you other than it's best to figure that out up front. You know, you, unfortunately, you have, just have to do the math to figure out the time frame that you want. Is it possible to do it online with what you have available? And then you can go back and figure out, okay, it's gonna cost a certain amount for snowball, it's gonna cost a certain amount for data sync, but that comes back to, to one of the earlier points of when do you have to finish by? If you have enough time to do it with Data Sync or with Snowball Edge, then you know, there, there are pros and cons to both. 
you know, using Snowball Edge, you have to receive devices, unlock them, plug them into your network, copy data to them, package them up, ship them back, which isn't that complex. It's a fully self-contained device, and the shipping label's on a Kindle on the top, and it, you know, changes automatically, so there's not a lot to think about. But that is a physical process, it's a manual process. With data sync, you gotta have a server running that we can load the agents onto, and you gotta have the network to be able to do it, and someone still has to create the jobs. So there's a manual aspect to both. Um, with data sync, once you get everything created, you can schedule the jobs and let them run. With Snowball Edge, you still have that process of unlocking it, connecting it to the network, and copying data to it, no matter what. You just, you can't automate the physical side of it. So, it depends on the infrastructure that you have, the staff that you have, um, how quickly you want to get it done, and you know, what the network looks like. So I know that's a long answer. It's, it's one of those things that, that there just isn't an easy answer for it. You have to go through the process of figuring out all of those things and weighing the pros and cons of both based on what your business objectives are. Storage gateway to move from cloud to on-prem. Um, yeah, you can use data sync and storage gateway for that. So data sync will read out of S3 or out of uh, EFS and write to a file share on-prem, on-premises. With file gateway, it only connects to S3, but it, it gives you a file system representation of that S3 bucket, so you can read out any data that's in S3 uh, using the file gateway. Yes. Yeah, file gateway, all the storage gateway models and data sync all run inside of EC2. So you can use all of them to, to move data around. Um, you know, data sync, can you throttle the bandwidth when you like to? Because sometimes I want to go full 100 gig and the phone is mine, uh, not business hours. Business hours, I want to throttle it down. So the question is can you throttle bandwidth on, on data sync? You can. Um, it's not real time. So if a job is running and it's been running wide open and it's now 8.30 and you say, oh, I need to slow this down, um, until that job finishes, it's gonna keep running at the same speed. So, but you can change the speed. You just, you're gonna have to stop the job and restart the job if there's a job active. But if, if you can change it between jobs or leave it until that job finishes, then anything that happens after that is gonna go at whatever the throttled rate is. For the source side, no, that's it. Yeah, if, I mean, if you have iSCSI and you want to move that volume data in, uh, there's actually a, mo a mode on the storage gateway, the volume gateway, uh, called stored volume mode. And you can, you can insert a storage gateway in stored volume mode in the path between your iSCSI array and the initiator. And then we will actually pass that information through. So as far as the initiator, the server's concerned, nothing has changed, except maybe it now has a different uh, iSCSI ID or IP address that it's connecting to. But the file system's still there, the file system ID, the signature, all of that stays the same. And we will move the blocks up into S3. We don't convert it into a file system. It still stays as a block device, but you can take EBS snapshots and give those EBS snapshots to an EC2 instance. So it is a way to migrate block data into AWS and make it available through EBS. Yeah, all, all the signatures, encryption, everything else would be the same because we, as a service, Storage Gateway is unaware of the content on the disk. It's just seeing raw blocks on the device. So all of that stuff stays, stays the same. Other questions? Is there a service that can stop and uh, let's talk after because I, I want to make sure that I give you the right answer to that. I'm, I'm not sure. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much.